The story behind the headlines. Every Sunday evening at this time, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the American Historical Association, presents Caesar Searchinger in his analysis of the news. In this analysis, Mr. Searchinger draws upon research material especially prepared for these broadcasts by eminent historians. And now, Caesar Searchinger. Good evening, everybody. Almost exactly a year ago, the British Labour government was swept into power. The war in Europe was over. The end of the Far Eastern War was in sight. The British turned out their coalition war government and elected their first Labour majority to usher in the peace. Today, a year later, bread is being rationed in England for the first time. Practically everything but bread was rationed during the war and still is. The belated imposition of bread rationing is a sharp reminder that Britain is still facing privations a year after the fighting ceased. When the war stopped, post-war austerity began. The war, the people, took it, as they had taken it during the war. They will take bread rationing too, though there has been something like a revolt, among the bakers at least. Bread rationing is only one of the many hardships that Britons have to put up with after a year of so-called peace. In contrast to our own hustle to take the lid off after VJ Day, the British realized that war conditions would have to continue for an indefinite time. There was remarkable little grumbling. Maybe people were too relieved after the four-year nightmare of bombing, too happy to have some of their men home again to care much about comforts and food. They knew that victory was expensive. They knew that Britain had not only spent her substance but mortgaged her future, liquidating her foreign assets and borrowing huge sums abroad to carry on her military operations. They know now that they must pay. They remember the light-hearted return to normalcy after the last war, and they remember what it led to, a short boom in a long depression, unemployment, the dole. They remember the collapse of their foreign trade, lifeblood of their economy, and the default on their foreign debt. Britons do not want to go through all that again. That is why they voted very soberly for the Labour Party leaders who painted no rainbows for them. They were told that prosperity could be recaptured only through increased production and an expanded foreign trade in a world in which many old markets were destroyed by war. They were told that all this meant hard work and more tightening of belts. This became even more obvious with our sudden stopping of Lend-Lease and the lingering uncertainty over the dollar loan. Now that the loan has become effective, the government's problem has been somewhat eased, but the people feel no sort of relief. For the loan is a two-way transaction with a quid pro quo. It is only part of a long-term agreement of two great trading countries to cooperate in reviving world trade. It will not mean much in the way of relaxation or loosening of belts, and it means less today in terms of buying power than it would have meant six months ago under effective price control. Britons today are frankly worried about our economy. They see us heading for inflation, and maybe worse. The British have done a remarkable job in reconversion, after an almost total conversion of their industries to war. Their factories are producing again at high level, everything from cloth to motor cars, not for Britons, however, but for better-heeled customers abroad. They themselves continue to do without. But the dire consequences that Churchill predicted for socialism have not materialized, and the people are as solidly behind their government as they were during the war. Yet the Labour government has not been shy about its far-reaching scheme of nationalization, a program which Prime Minister Attlee calls a planned economy designed to promote full employment, economic prosperity, and justice for all. In the first year of the Attlee government, the Bank of England and the coal mines have been nationalized. Bills to nationalize the steel industry, civil aviation, public utilities, telecommunications, and transport are in the process of passage. Bills creating a national health service and a national insurance system are in preparation. Since the government commands a large majority, and since there is genuine two-party government in Britain, these bills are sure of passage. Even the Conservative House of Lords can only delay legislation. It can no longer stop it, except at the risk of its own life. This was demonstrated once again a little while ago, when their lordships ventured to amend the government's Investment Control Act, a measure to fit private investment into the country's planned economy. The amendment was rejected by the government, and the lords promptly backed down. Thirty-six years ago, the lords rejected the Liberal budget, 
the first British budget which deliberately set out to tax the rich to aid the poor. The consequence of that was the Parliament Act of 1911, which deprived the Lords of all say in financial matters and their veto power in others. So, with the acquiescence of a supine upper house, Britain today is headed for socialism, or social democracy, rather, the phrase preferred by the Labourites. At this stage, Labour's difficulty is not to persuade the opposition, but to satisfy its own followers. How long will they pull in their belts to build up a future prosperity based on foreign trade? This is where even the faith of the optimists may falter, for Britain, still dependent on overseas trade, can prosper only in a peaceful world. Therefore, Britain's future, aside from its safety, is bound up with the task of making peace. Her foreign policy begins at home. The Labour Party's foreign policy has come in for widespread criticism at home and abroad. Plus, Ernest Bevan has been accused by his own party of continuing the Tories' foreign policy, and that criticism has been loudly echoed here. There have been bitter words about Britain's policy in Greece and her gentle treatment of Franco-Spain, but criticizing an ally's foreign policy is rather like sitting in a glass house and throwing stones. The Greek policy, inherited from Churchill days, has had our official sanction for the simple reason that neither we nor the British were prepared to see Greece go communist, like its neighbors to the north. And we, along with the British, have gone back to the non-intervention policy in Spain for more dubious political reasons. Both Greece and Spain are traditionally linked with Britain's command of the Mediterranean, a highway of empire. Empire and foreign trade are as essential to a labor government as to a conservative one. Yet the present government has gone further than any of its predecessors in loosening the bonds of empire. It has lost no time in making good its promise to start India on the road to real independence. It has pledged the withdrawal of British troops from Egypt within five years. It has given quasi-independence to Transjordan. It has promised to convert its mandates into trusteeships under the United Nations. If Churchill did not become the king's first minister in order to liquidate the British Empire, his successor would hardly care to repeat that boast. But the severest censure on the Labour government has been on account of Palestine. Palestine, like Egypt, lies close to the Suez Canal. Its importance as a military base would certainly be enhanced by the withdrawal of troops from Egypt. Some people have jumped to the conclusion that this is at the bottom of British policy towards the Palestine Jews. It has been alleged that for purely imperialistic reasons, the British are favoring the Arabs in Palestine rather than the Jews. The Arab League, say these people, is a mere creature of Britain who wishes to consolidate her position in the Middle East. Whatever its origin, the Arab League today is a rising force. It comprises seven countries in the Middle East, and it claims to speak for 34 million people spread over a million square miles. It is the instrument of an awakening nationalism which must be reckoned with. As a hostile force, it would certainly be a potential threat to Britain. That is why the Arabs were wooed by the fascists and the Nazis in the past, and they are now being wooed with honeyed words from the Moscow radio. Yet it does not seem reasonable that a British government would deliberately alienate the Jews, whom it has favored as hardly another country has favored them in modern times, simply for the sake of coddling the Arabs in Palestine. Unless there were a compelling necessity, the British would not wish to risk the sympathy of millions of Americans, for they know that the Jews are a potent political force over here. As it is, Britain all but lost that all-important American loan. Paid advertisements headed, Kill That Loan, have appeared all over this country, signed by pro-Zionist groups. Today, Palestine is as ticklish a subject to talk about as Spain. Moreover, it is sub judice since an Anglo-American conference sitting in London is discussing the famous Palestine report, even now. That report of the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, as you will remember, recommended the admission to Palestine of 100,000 refugees as rapidly as conditions will permit. That's quoted. The British government has so far refused to implement that recommendation, at least not without the help of American military forces. President Truman has promised technical and financial aid, but the British feel that we should share the responsibility in the use of force, 
considering recent bloodshed and threat of further violence in Palestine. While this attitude is being violently attacked by the interested parties, the committee itself will discuss not only this recommendation, but the other nine contained in the report. It is pertinent, therefore, to recall what some of these recommendations are. In the first place, the report makes clear that Palestine cannot meet all the immigration needs of the Jewish victims of Nazi persecution. It recommends that the British, American, and other governments endeavor immediately to find new homes for all such displaced persons. The report further recommends a continuation of the British mandate pending the setting up of the United Nations trusteeship. It says that the Jewish agency, the responsible Jewish authority for Palestine, should at once resume active cooperation in the suppression of terrorism. The report specifically rejects the idea that every Jew may enter Palestine as of right. It says that it is for the government of Palestine to decide, having regard to the well-being of all the people in Palestine, the number of immigrants to be admitted within a given period. It rejects the view that there should be no further Jewish immigration without the acquiescence of the Arabs. But it also rejects the Zionist demand to speed up immigration so as to produce a Jewish majority and eventually a Jewish state. In fact, the report accepts the historical claims of both the Jews, based on Bible evidence, and the Arabs, based on 13 centuries of continuous residence. It emphatically declares that Palestine, quote, is a holy land, sacred to Christians as well as to Jews and Arabs, and therefore can never become a land which any race or religion can justly claim as its very own. And it adds, any attempt to establish an independent Palestine state or states would result in civil strife such as might threaten the peace of the world. Such is the tenor of the report that the American and British representatives are discussing now. Neither the Arabs nor the Jews are prepared to accept it, though the Zionists continue to clamor for the implementation of the single recommendation they like admitting 100,000 refugees at once. This recommendation, which would increase the Jewish population by 16%, in the face of Arab hostility, the British feel they cannot risk at this time. Aside from its economic worries, the policy of Soviet Russia, and the policy of Soviet Russia, Palestine is the British government's biggest headache today. And like most of its other troubles, it is inherited from Britain's Tory past. Now, the root of this particular trouble goes back to the original and rather ambiguous commitment made during World War by the British, the Balfour Declaration, promising the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine at a time when the Jewish population of Palestine was only 11%. It was the British army that had conquered Palestine from the Turks. Yet without the Arab revolt and Arab cooperation, that conquest would not have been possible. Whatever Britain's motives at the time, dictated no doubt by her own imperial interests, she cannot now ignore either party to the deal, neither the Arabs nor the Jews. Nor can she fly in the face of this country whose interests are so closely identified with her own. But let us not forget that this country has done virtually nothing to solve the problem except giving advice. We have not opened our doors to the refugees and no revision of our immigration quotas is in sight. Good night. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations in cooperation with the American Historical Association have presented Caesar Searchinger. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.